and welcome everyone to today's Synergis webinar, Boothless Technologies Create New Opportunities for Hearing Assessment and Conservation. I'm Kay Bechtold, Managing Editor of the Synergis, the magazine of AIJ. I'd like to thank all of our attendees and especially Adari for sponsoring today's webinar. Our speaker today is Jesse Norris, an engineer with Adari. In the area of auditory science, he has worked on understanding relationships between custom earplugs, attenuation and comfort, developing algorithm, algorithms and hardware to support auto acoustic emissions research and designing and building new hearing test equipment that may be paired with mobile devices to increase the reach of hearing healthcare. He recently joined Adari with the objective of transitioning hearing related technologies from research into products. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Jesse. Great, thank you, Kay. And thank you all for joining this afternoon. So what I'm gonna talk about today is boothless technologies. And these are technologies that are a little bit different in the context of hearing. And the idea is that they're gonna allow us to create new opportunities for both this hearing assessment and something that is um, relevant to industrial hygiene association in terms of hearing conservation. And so we're gonna go through a couple of different examples of how this equipment is working and talk about some of the challenges. A few disclaimers to get us going. Um, the first one is that one of the systems I'm gonna be talking about today, the Wireless Automated Hearing Test System, or WATS, has been graciously supported through a number of grants within National Institute of Deafness, Other Communication Disorders, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, and through the Department of the Army. That said, um, this does not necessarily represent the official views of the NIH nor the Department of Defense, and I work for the company that has developed the WATS and the views expressed in this presentation are my own. So I'm moving on to slide three, and I'm gonna go over what we're gonna talk about. So to kind of bring this into the context that everyone's familiar with, I wanna start with some background material. We're gonna talk first about hearing conservation and hearing conservation programs and what the objectives are. We'll then spend a little bit of time talking about the regulations and the types of uh, requirements regarding who can perform the different types of tests and the types of services that are typically part of hearing conservation programs. We'll then spend a little bit of time going through the traditional technologies that are used in hearing conservation. Um, we're typically looking at sound booths and installations and how those programs are typically operated and run. And then I want to talk a little bit about boothless audiometry. And this is something that has really come out in just the last few years and is starting to gain momentum within traditional hearing testing. And we'll talk about some of the challenges that are faced with boothless audiometry and some of the opportunities. Uh, one particular opportunity that we're going to spend a little bit of time on is talking about something that's referred to as fit testing of hearing protectors. And this is something that is very similar to fit testing of other personal protective equipment, things like respiratory fit testing. And the idea is to make sure that a hearing protector is properly providing someone the protection that is, is required in order to protect their hearing and be part of the program. We'll talk about some broader opportunities within the context of what boothless audiometry might mean, not only for um, hearing conservation programs, but even outside in terms of treatment and opportunities. And then we'll conclude and wrap up the talk, take some questions. So the objective of a hearing conservation program is stated here in blue. It's really to prevent the occurrence and reduce the progression of occupational noise-induced hearing loss. And these basic program components are what NIOSH recommends that a hearing conservation program should include. It begins with noise exposure monitoring. And this is the idea of looking at throughout an, a facility or an area where there may be high levels of noise that would be reach a level such that they would be of a concern or present a hazard to people working in that environment. The first step ideally would be to solve those noise exposure issues with either engineering or administrative controls. This can be as basic as finding better ways to isolate the noise from the people that are working around the equipment to implementing um, exposure uh, hazards to, or exposure um, protocols to limit the exposure time someone spends near hazardous noise. This is very similar to other areas where there's hazardous um, uh, potential hazards and ways to solve them or work around them. The next part of the program includes audiometric evaluation. So this is the hearing testing that we normally talk about within hearing conservation programs. And this is to make sure that we understand what people's hearing status currently is, and then to monitor it year over year to make sure that we're um, keeping track of any progression that may be caused by work-related noise or other um, hazards. Another really important part of a hearing conservation program is the use and the fit of hearing protection devices. 
In fact, OSHA mandates that the employer is actually responsible for the proper fit and proper selection of hearing protection devices that are used by the employees in these situations. The, the last three parts have to do with education and monitoring, and this is making sure that a program is providing the proper education to the workforce to understand both how to use the hearing protections and have motivation and an understanding of why um, they should be wearing the hearing protection in terms of the implications it can have for their um, the, the quality of life really in the long term. And then there are requirements on record keeping. And then the entire program they recommend is something that is evaluated and goes through an audit to make sure that it is meeting that objective that we started with at the top. The particular area we're gonna focus on with Boothless Audiometry today are these three elements. We're gonna talk about the hearing testing equipment that's part of the audiometric evaluations. We're gonna talk a little bit about the fit of hearing protection devices, some of the new technologies that are coming out to make this a more uh, easier to implement in practice. And as part of that, some of the hearing protection devices have been shown to have a big impact on people's education and understanding of how to properly wear their hearing protectors. And there's some implications, uh, a number of recent studies and protocols that have come out regarding best practices around training um, people on how to use their hearing protectors properly. So I'd like to introduce a few terms that we're talking about, uh, the, just to get us all on the same page. The first is hearing screening. And hearing screening has to do with a type of hearing test that is really meant to be as quick as possible. And it is meant to do one of two things. It can either be a type of a pass or refer result that is usually to direct someone to more hearing testing or medical care, or it can be a screening that might be used to have make sure someone has a minimal requirement in order to do a certain particular type of job. Uh, again, these tests are meant to be very quick and easy to implement. The middle section here, occupational hearing test, is often uh, or is also referred to as audiometric monitoring or um, pure tone threshold testing. The idea behind this test is to determine the sensitivity of the listener's hearing in each ear. And this is the test we normally think of where someone is presented a, a stimuli, a pure tone, and they are responding or not responding. What you're hoping to do is identify the point at which this, this person is able to hear and respond reliably to the tone about 50% of the times. So they call this the threshold of hearing. And that's typically done over a number of frequencies. And those results are presented in what is referred to as an audiogram. And that audiogram is not meant to be, uh, you won't be able to necessarily read this one, but normally what happens is an audiogram is you have a series of frequencies along the X axis and a series of hearing levels along the Y axis. And audiologists and people in the hearing industry will use these to track how hear people's hearing change over time or to identify issues where someone may have uh, have, have certain hearing loss and, and what particular frequencies it's impacting. I'll point out that in occupational hearing testing is very similar to what's done in diagnostics, with the difference being that diagnostics typically have uh, additional test frequencies or may have other modalities such as speech and bone conduction, other tests that are more involved. The last column here, the hearing protector fit test, is, is one of the, the newer tests that is being introduced um, through a number of, uh, of uh, companies and a number of individuals through research of the last decade or so. And the idea behind the hearing protector fit test is to provide the measurement of the attenuation or the protection someone, an individual actually achieves when they wear a certain hearing protector. This is really important because a lot of the laboratory studies, so things that are normally listed on a particular hearing protector, are, are based on exactly that. They're based on a laboratory setting, and under those conditions, people have shown that in practice, people are rarely achieved those levels of attenuation without additional training. And so what people have done is they've shown that there are these new techniques to basically provide a quantitative measure that can be used to both evaluate that a hearing protector does work for someone and then simultaneously provide some feedback to them so that they know what it should feel like when they've properly used that hearing protector and what it should sound like when they've actually achieved the protection that they need. So how are these um, different terms applied in practice? Um, and what I'm listing here is kind of where they're typically used and if there's any requirements or who may actually administer these tests. So for hearing screening, this is the one that is often used. A good example of these is the Department of Transportation has certain requirements for um, truck and bus drivers regarding a hearing and also for pilots. And again, these are often used to basically screen someone to make sure they've met a requirement, a minimum level of requirement to use their hearing in a way that has been deemed important to that particular job. This type of hearing screening can be administered by anyone. The next block, the pure tone threshold testing, that's that audiometric monitoring. This is what we think of the bread and butter that's used in occupational hearing conservation programs. 
And this is to monitor those hearing thresholds of workers that are exposed to noise. And it's typically done annually. And it needs to be performed by someone who's uh, either been certified or has been trained and is under the direct supervision by a licensed audiologist or a physician. Um, or an audiologist themselves can actually perform uh, this testing. And there are certain um, uh, programs that, that use audiologists directly to perform the, uh, the occupational monitoring. Closely related to that is that hearing protector fit testing. And again, this is that verifying that hearing protectors are actually providing the adequate protection. And this currently can be performed by anyone. There's no special rules or regulations regarding who can use those systems or interpret those results. And for completeness, I've listed on here the diagnostic audiometry, and that's the more involved testing. And this kicks into gear once there's an investigation of uh, possible work-related hearing loss or claims related to uh, workers' compensation. And that's performed by an audiologist or licensed physician. So I want to talk a little bit about what happens to these tests, and I want to be very clear, this is kind of an overly simplified version of this, but I want to go through it in the context of where does boothless audiometry fit? And really where boothless audiometry or any sort of audiometric monitoring fits at kind of what is would be step zero, it's actually conducting the tests, and then step one, a lot of these systems will then aggregate the results and step two, where the people are able to then review the results. So what happens is someone may go through, um, depending on the size of the program, and may, may be testing multiple people a day. Uh, in the case of military, they're testing hundreds of people a day, and they're aggregating these results. And then a physician or an audiologist needs to review those results and decide whether or not, first, the test is valid, or if there may be something that would make it invalid, such as an individual may have had a a noise exposure the day before that may invalidate a test. They're then looking for things that are referred to as a standard threshold shift. And what this means is that uh, someone has shown a change in their hearing status relative to a baseline, which was um, maybe taken at least a year ahead or maybe years, years before then. And what they're looking at is, does that standard threshold shift indicate that there may be some hearing loss that has occurred? that's true, then they're typically rescheduling and they're trying to do that within, in, in some cases, the regulations require doing that within 30 days to then confirm a standard threshold shift. Once a standard threshold shift has been confirmed, it then goes into the next level of diagnostic testing. And this is where it's normally performed by an audiologist who will go in and do um, not only additional tests, but will also combine that with other information, such as their noise exposure history, uh, their work history, the hearing protectors that they've been fitted with and conditions outside of the, their workplace as well to determine whether or not it could be something that was uh, definitely related to work or whether there may be other activities a person's involved in. Ultimately, from there, it becomes down to step four, which is if it's determined to be work-related, uh, either the employee has the option of filing a separate, an additional separate claim, um, compensation to workers' comp, or some companies will automatically file the, uh, the whole thing for investigation. So again, I want to be clear, this is kind of what happens to all these test results. This is an overly simplified thing, but the idea is to just provide a little context of what happens and how these test results are evaluated. And that's all part of, um, as you might imagine, a, 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 this is, hearing testing has been conducted for a number of decades, and it is a highly um, regulated by a number of different um, agencies, and, uh, and these agencies include OSHA, um, MSHA, the Mining Safety Health Administration, the DOT, which has uh, even each kind of umbrella under there has their own requirements. Um, and then the Department of Defense also has their own hearing conservation program requirements. And the key here is that all of these different groups have different requirements on recording and reporting the criteria for work-related hearing loss. So I'm not going to go into the details of any one of these in particular, but it's more to point out that they're, depending on the industry you're operating in, you have to be knowledgeable about what uh, requirements are applicable. The one group that's on here that does not specifically have requirements or regulations is NIOSH. And NIOSH, what they are doing is they publish um, both recommended, the, they publish the recommended exposure limits, which sort of help you evaluate whether or not someone needs to be in a hearing conservation program. And they provide a number of good guidelines um, on best practices to prevent hearing loss. And they've conducted a lot of research into things like fit testing to, to figure out the best ways to make sure that protect employees from, uh, from hearing loss. So along, along the lines of a highly regulated industry, there's typically a lot of training and professional organizations that will prepare people for these different types of roles. So if you recall in the beginning, we talked about who can perform the occupational hearing, the audiometric monitoring task. And there's the Council for uh, Accreditation and Occupational Hearing Conservation, or CAHOC, and they provide 
um, uh, kind of what are typically grouped as three different levels are sort of the ability to be a trained audiometric technician, so someone who can run the equipment and record the results. There's someone who's a course director that can train audiometric technicians, then there's someone, the per professional supervisor level, which is someone who can oversee and make sure that the, uh, the, the um, program is being run correctly. Now, all those have to be run or overseen by either a physician or a licensed audiologist, and then with audiologists um, have to ultimately pass a number of certification exams, and they typically require passing a, a, a national exam as well. And the one professional organization I wanted to make sure people were aware of is that the National Hearing Conservation Association is a, a highly multidisciplinary organization that kind of focuses on all the different aspects of hearing conservation, and their, their sole mission is to make sure that people understand adopt best practices in the uh, in the field of making sure that people are protecting their hearing. So I want to talk a little bit about what this looks like currently and what boothless technologies mean. So a traditional booth setup is what's shown on this slide here, and it is designed to isolate the person who's going to be taking that test from any outside or ambient background noise. And these booths typically someone will, uh, a single person booth will look like the one that's shown here. They will they will sit down in that booth and they will interact with an audiologist or someone who's running the equipment external from that system. And all of the wires that connect between the person who's using the equipment to generate the stimuli and the person to respond are, are what's called passed through the booth. So you end up with a, a, a lot of wires going back and forth between the equipment that is used to generate the stimuli and the person that's inside the booth. And where you find these typical uh, test locations, and, and again, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the industrial testing. Um, industrial testing will either use what are called fixed installations of sound booths. So this is an investment that a company will make in setting up uh, um, what's shown in this picture here is a multi-person booth where people can come in and take hearing tests all at once. Or they'll have um, potentially a mobile service provider that will drive up uh, either a mobile van or a large 18 wheeler that has been outfitted with both the hearing test equipment and has been outfitted with a lot of soundproofing and isolation in order to, so that people can conduct the tests under um, requirements that meet the uh, meet the level the background noise level that's appropriate for conducting hearing tests. So when you look across all the equipment that's required, you have the sound booths. And these again come in anywhere from a single sound booth that can be installed or, or potentially um, uh, moved around a facility, a multiple person sound booth. Again, these are usually um, larger companies or potentially um, external providers where people will send their employees to go to a certain location that has an installed multi person booth. Or there are mobile, uh, mobile options where people will bring large sound booth enclosures to a particular employer to conduct the testing. In addition to the sound booth, you have the equipment that is responsible for generating the stimuli and running the testing. And these are referred to as audiometers. And I've just kind of picked pictures of uh, three of the, the typical things that you'll see. One is a full diagnostic audiometer. This is not typically used in industrial settings. This is, has a lot of the additional features for bone conduction and other types of testing. You can have a portable diagnostic audiometer. So this is moving to something that's designed to just be a little bit more compact and easier to bring um, bring on site or to, go, or to go to certain locations. And then the one that's really typically used in industrial testing is a computer controlled um, setup where these are designed to be connected so you can test multiple people at once. And they're really only for air conduction testing. So the type of things where someone's going to wear a set of headphones and they're going to be presented stimuli and they're going to respond whether or not they heard that stimuli. In addition to the audiometer, then you then have the transducers, the things that actually are generating the stimuli that the person's responding to. And these fall into three different types. They're what are referred to as super oral transducers. And these are what have traditionally been used and these will rest on top of the ear. So super oral means right on top of the ear. You'll have circumoral earphones. And these provide a little bit more isolation from background noise. And circumoral headphones are like you think of a large headset that has some padding that actually goes around the ear. And then there are insert earphones. And insert earphones um, will typically have foam or a material that is squeezed down and placed carefully into the ear canal to create a seal. And it's very important to do that properly so that you get really good coupling between the stimuli and the person that's going to be listening and responding to that. 
So how does Boothless ideology differ by this? Well, the biggest thing is that the idea is to get away from requiring this large, either fixed infrastructure or these large mobile booths. And the innovation has really been driven by, um, by two things. I'd say initially it was driven by mobile devices. People recognize that a lot of the tablets, phones, the things that we have now can produce sound and have all the smarts in them that is enough to run a hearing test. And the other thing is that mobile devices provide a lot of connectivity. So the ability to aggregate and send results places provides a lot of value in terms of when you're thinking about testing a lot of people on, on site and aggregating a lot of data. The other thing, in, and in particular in our case that has accelerated this has been, uh, unfortunately, COVID-19. And the reason is that COVID-19 has forced a lot of those booths, which were, you could imagine packing six or eight people into a tight, small space that often wasn't ventilated all that great. And so they've had to have a lot of the booths either halt or operate at significantly reduced capacity. So in particular, the military had a really big need where hearing is considered part of their medical readiness, and they needed the ability to test more people to make sure that the people were meeting the requirements in order to deploy. And so what's happening or what are people doing to kind of create these boothless test systems? I'd say that many products right now are simply taking the equipment that's been used in a booth and they're just taking it outside the booth and they're monitoring the background of the ambient noise. And the idea here is that if you can find a location that is quiet enough and provide a real time system to monitor the background noise, you can meet the OSHA um, requirements, assuming that that background noise does not exceed uh, certain levels. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means in the next couple of slides. So one of the biggest difficulties or one of the biggest challenges that's faced by boothless systems is, is, is that performing these measurements, getting accurate hearing thresholds require the listener's attention and focus. And so in this context, background noise poses two problems. The first is if the background noise is too high, it limits the ability for the to test to the quietest stimuli. Um, so in other words, if the level is simply too loud in the background, it becomes impossible to ever test someone's true hearing. And what you're really responding to is just the fact that, or you're, what you might see as an abnormal, uh, uh, an incorrect hearing loss is simply because the background noise was too loud. The other thing is, is the background noise um, can distract the listener. And this is especially true in boothless systems where um, they're often being used in locations where people are not necessarily um, monitoring the transient noise. So these are like, think of it as intermittent noises. And it's very important to understand what's happening in an intermittent noise sense, as opposed to when they traditionally installed a large fixed installation, they would go through weeks or months of evaluating that location as a potentially good spot to put a sound booth in the first place. So it becomes very important to understand the implications that transient or abnormal intermittent noises can pose um, when conducting these testings. I want to talk a little bit about the tools that are used to conduct the, the background noise measurement or the ambient noise. It's typically something called a sound level meter. And a sound level meters, uh, the important part that I want everyone to take away here is that there are um, different accuracy requirements based on something called the class or the type. And the um, type is actually dictated by um, to which regulation you're, you're operating under in terms of which which type you actually need or which class you need to make a certain uh, level of background noise. And what these sound level meters are used for, what they do is they measure the noise and they put the energy in an octave band. So this is typically the energy around a given frequency. And ANSI, um, ISO, OSHA, and uh, NHCA have all published recommended levels. They call them the maximum permissible ambient noise levels, where you can be confident that if you've reached a certain level, what is the situation or the guideline that you can then test or test a pure tone at that, at that frequency? And so a lot of the boothless systems now integrate with sound level meters to monitor the ambient noise and will provide warnings or will pause the system. Uh, and this is again, to make sure that you are meeting the OSHA requirements, meeting those requirements that you can actually do boothless audiometry outside of the booth by keeping knowledge of what is the background noise that presents all those challenges. So the next couple of slides I'm going to talk about are actually what this looks like in practice. And so one of the things that we've done for the, this is a, a paper that we did with our, uh, one of our early collaborators was to actually measure different locations in a facility where someone might actually try to set up and do boost this audiometry. So this was actually a new Belgian brewery and we we're grateful for their participation in this. We went in and we measured 
uh, we actually let them select rooms that they thought would be quiet enough. And we went in and measured multiple. They were often conference rooms or office spaces, or um, a, a, there was a mobile trailer at back. And what they went in is they measured the differences, uh, or they measured the noise levels in each of these octave band frequencies. And we looked at what's shown on the graph here. Uh, let me see if I can do an annotation real quick. Okay, so what's shown on the graph in this gray region is the noise level, which you need to be below in order to uh, meet the OSHA requirements. And what you can see is that, believe it or not, there are no, um, there were locations in, that they had tried that were simply going to be too loud a good percentage of the time. So these were certain rooms that even they identified as, and, and they really struggled with the low frequencies, the 500 Hertz. And OSHA actually does not have requirements at 250 or 150. Um, so what's overlaid here, the ANSI and the ISO requirements for those lower ones. And again, you can see there's no locations actually that meet the requirements for these uh, low frequencies. And even within the 500 Hertz, there was a lot of locations that did not meet the requirements for OSHA. So what to do in those situations? So what we have been working towards was a device that basically creates the attenuation, the passive attenuation within the headphone, within the earphone itself. And what that means is that now you're, instead of requiring someone to step into a sound booth, you're providing sufficient isolation from the background noise simply in the headset. And so what we did was we went into that same location and these are results and they're the difference between the measurements as performed in those rooms, including rooms that did not meet the OSHA requirements compared to rooms that were performed under the traditional, like a mobile trailer that had this proper soundproofing and, the, and met the OSHA requirements. Um, and in, in general, the takeaway from all of this and, and similar studies is that boothless audiometry can be conducted when you're doing one of two things. One is making sure to monitor, or actually doing both things, making sure to monitor the background noise appropriately so that you know if it's exceeded and providing additional attenuation through a headset that allows you to, to make sure that you are meeting those, those quietest levels. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, another study that was done by uh, uh, Douglas Brunghart. And I'm gonna, there's a lot of lines in this graph, so I'm gonna do my best to use my annotation tool to take you through them. The first is the line in the very bottom. And what that shows is that is the ANSI requirement for the maximum permissible ambient noise levels um, with what are called ears uncovered. So this would be, a, the, in order to conduct a test, you want your sound room to be at least that quiet. And then what's shown in these two gray lines, so there's a gray line here, and there's a gray line here that's a little bit thicker. Those are locations within uh, John Hopkins, and I can't remember the, the acronym for the other one, but they are sites where they wanted to be able to perform hearing tests. So you can see the noise level in those sites was significantly above the level that was, uh, was desired. And what they've then shown in these other three graphs, and I'll go through each one at a time, the first is that the Sennheiser HDA 300, so this is Sennheiser's current headset, it does provide enough attenuation at four kilohertz and above. However, at two kilohertz and below, it was nowhere near enough attenuation in order to meet these requirements um, for even the quieter of the two locations that they checked out. The next closest one is shown here in the dashed dotted line, and that's the Sennheiser HDA 200. This headset is unfortunately no longer made by Sennheiser, um, but it had significantly better attenuation in these uh, mid and low frequencies where yes, it could have been used for one kilohertz and above, but at 500 kilohertz, it started to become marginal and then below that it simply could not be used. So it could not be used for things that are used to do conductive hearing loss in particular. Going up from there, the next one is the, what are referred to as insert hearing protectors. And it's well known that um, the ER3As, these deep insert hearing protectors, will provide a lot of isolation from background noise, provided that they are inserted correctly. And there's a big caveat there, because just as we were talking about with fit testing and foam uh, pr protectors, uh, it can take a lot of skill and a lot of care to very carefully insert and make sure that you've, um, you've actually achieved a good seal in the ear canal. And then the top graph is the headset that we've been developing and working on, which shows 
that we met all of the uh, noise level requirements from uh, all the way to one, the 250 hertz all the way through uh, 8 kilohertz uh, in either of these two locations that they've been looking at. And so I want to talk a little bit now, you know, I've zoomed in, I've just talked a little bit about the particular headset we've developed. I want to talk a little bit about other systems that are apparently available right now. So there are first two are a system called uh, from a company called Herex and a system from a company called uh, CUDA Wave. These two systems both use insert hearing protectors, and they will use insert hearing protectors that are then placed under larger isolating um, uh, hearing protectors, actually. And the, and the idea is that those systems can be used, and there are publications, I'd be happy to, I've got some in the references, uh, that have shown that those systems can be used outside of booths reliably for uh, both occupational and for um, diagnostic hearing testing. GSI has recently introduced something that they call the AMTAS, which is a, an automated uh, hearing test system. And although this particular picture on the, the right is shown inside a booth, that same system with the uh, with a with a transducer or an earphone that's similar to the HD200 is, is currently being marketed and used as a boothless system, um, in particular for, uh, for testing outside of the booths. Benson Medical um, has 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 a number of systems. They don't have any that have particularly high attenuation, but what they have been doing is Benson has done a very nice job of creating a good seamless interaction with noise level monitoring. So again, one of the there were kind of two ways I could mention that things could happen. One is that you make sure that the environment you've chosen meets those requirements, and the second is to make sure that ideally you have some additional um, attenuation provided by the headset such that you can operate in a louder environment. Shoebox is probably one of the ones that has closest, Shoebox and Herex are probably the two other systems that use mobile devices uh, extensively. Shoebox builds their software into an iPad, and then that iPad is connected uh, just through normal uh, cabling to, a, to a, whether earphones or other transducers to be used in a testing setting. And then the last one here is the system that um, we've been developing, which has referred to as the wireless automated hearing test system. And the Watts has been designed for two things in particular. One is that additional isolation. And the other thing is that up to this point, all these systems have primarily been in working on a one-on-one -on -one interaction with the exception of uh, Benson has done some, uh, some multi-person testing. But we've now been partnered with the, and working with the Army for a number of years where we're looking at testing multiple people at once. And this is a thing that's incredibly important to occupational hearing testing as a lot of that testing is conducted eight, 10 people at a time and making sure to manage all those people in the context of this new boothless audiometry session or uh, equipment is very important. Sorry. So a little bit more on what is the Watts. Uh, the Watts itself is a wireless audiometric headphone that has the embedded audiometer inside of it. And so when we first started down this path, we realized there were four things that we really wanted to achieve. The first was that with moving to mobile technologies, it is incredibly important with audiometric test equipment that you meet very stringent regulations for the calibration of the stimuli and repeatability of the stimuli, um, and 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 even even to make sure that that stimuli doesn't vary with anything that the mobile device could be doing. And so we made a decision that actually we wanted to invest and create an audiometer. So all the electronics that you normally see in an audiometer are actually located inside the hearing protector. So inside the hearing protector, you have a full audiometer. So obviously that audiometer doesn't have any way to display or be controlled. And so what happens is the control for that happens through just a mobile device. So someone can fire up a tablet, connect to the headset, and then do things like test different stimuli, or in the case of automated testing, can actually uh, be able to respond directly on the tablet themselves. And so what's shown on the picture here is the idea that we're moving this model from what's a single walled sound booth with someone sitting inside and responding into something where the single walled sound booth is really achieved through the through the device itself. The second thing is that we chose and designed some hearing um, ear cups that are really designed to have extremely high isolation and in particular at low frequencies. So a lot of hearing protectors that exist in the market right now are not overly concerned with um, uh, uh, with a lot of uh, Low, hear low frequency hearing because in order to get low frequency hearing attenuation, you need to be heavy and you need to be large. Um, and so we made a compromise because you're not wearing these for eight hours a day. You're typically wearing them for less than 20 minutes to conduct a hearing test. 
that we wanted to make sure that we provided the optimal attenuation at those lower frequencies. So these ear cups have been specially designed, uh, not only the, the mass, but even the volume and shape inside of them to make sure that they provide a lot of attenuation that's, again, on par with a single world sound booth. The third thing was that one of the things that happens in hearing testing when you're trying to get through people efficiently is that you want to be able to make sure to adjust the hearing protector over the person's ears as easily as possible. And so we had an, a really creative designer who helped us rethink a headband design that this individual can do reliably on their own. And the difference from what happens right now with a lot of hearing protectors in particular is, again, you're usually assigning that one hearing protector or even when you're doing a normal audiometric test to that one person, they use what's called friction fit. And that requires you kind of put them in one position and then you slide or push them back and forth. And so we've developed something that allows the, an individual to basically seamlessly put these on their head without um, without needing the audiologist or the person who's running the testing to manually refit or re readjust that. And of course, the last thing was we wanted to eliminate cables from the system. And the reason is the cables not only are um, they become one of the largest failure points in systems, especially systems that are uh, mobile or are connected to lighter weight devices. So you can imagine that if someone walks with a headset that's connected to a tablet and they you know, this happens in practice, right? They stand up before they're done with their test and they're still connected and all of a sudden the tablet goes crashing onto the floor. So we wanted to have as much separation as possible from the headset and the device itself and also eliminate that failure point where cables, um, in the worst case, cables fail, sometimes fail in ways that are not easily detected uh, where they will still kind of work, but intermittently. So we've talked a little bit about using it just for hearing testing. I want to talk transition now to talking a little bit about the thing I mentioned very early on with earplug fit testing. So with this move to boothless audiometry and some of the changes that we're seeing within how people are running hearing conservation programs, I believe there's really an opportunity for us to rethink where earplug fitting can and should fit into hearing conservation. So there are currently uh, three other systems on the market that are um, really uh, uh, have been evaluated for fit testing. The first is from 3M, and 3M makes something they call their EAR fit system. And this is really unique, and it's actually a, a very um, elegant solution in the sense that it is purely objective. It requires using specially um, fit insert hearing protectors, which are these little yellow guys here that have small tubes off of them. And when someone inserts those into their ears, the system can then measure the sound outside the ear and play a stimuli and measure the sound that makes its way inside into the person's ear canal. So you get a very um, reliable and objective measurement of how well that hearing protector is fit into that person's ear. Of course, the downside is that it produces a lot of disposables and those, um, those tips are also uh, limited to only 3M products. The other two that are shown here, the Fit Tech Check Solo and the Benson CCF200. These are both uh, similar in the sense that they can be used on any insert hearing protector, and they're designed to fit over someone's ear. The downside to them is they can only be used for fit testing. So one of the things that's really neat about fit testing and hearing testing is it's really doing the same thing. You're basically measuring the threshold at which someone responds to stimuli. And an earplug fit test, all that you're doing is you're measuring the stimuli that they respond to with your earplug out of their ear, which is referred to an unoccluded measurement. And then you're measuring how much their thresholds increase when they've put an ear hearing protector in. And that difference tells you how well that hearing protector is working. And so you're using the same technology, the same equipment that can be used for audiometric testing as you are for fit testing. And that's where we believe there's really an opportunity to kind of rethink and just have one piece of equipment that can be reliably used and meet the requirements for both of these tasks that are performed, both the audiometric monitoring and the earplug fit testing. And I put a few quotes on here because I think one of the really exciting things about fit testing is as opposed to monitoring hearing, where what, what's happening is you're, you're making measurements and you're waiting until you have an indication. Hopefully you're catching someone before they have significant hearing loss. You're catching them just at the beginning of, a, of a, an indication that they might be having some hearing loss associated with noise. This is proactive in the sense you're making sure that someone understands how to wear their, um, wear their personal protective equipment, wear their earplugs correctly and is properly protecting their hearing. And one of the things that um, out of uh, Jeremy Fetterman's group, out of the Navy Summary Medical Research Lab, has spent a lot of time thinking about how to best 
use these as an educational tool and how long they need to and how long that education sticks with someone. And one of the quotes that I like best that you had is there that the training allows people to understand what a good fit feels like. And that's a really good way of describing when someone understands when they've properly put an insert ear and protector into their ear, what it feels like, they're much more likely to reliably reproduce that on their own. And this has been supported. The DOD has uh, recently, just a couple of years ago, actually adopted um, in, in their regulation that um, individual fit testing is recommended as best practice uh, when possible. So we're pretty excited to see that. So I'm going to take a step back a little bit and talk a little bit about broader opportunities. One of the things that boothless audiometry and in particular mobile technologies allow is better connection through the internet. And there's some really unique opportunities with teleaudiology. So where someone that may not be on site, but could interact directly with someone and conduct a hearing test remotely. We have seen this in particular, it's been driven by um, two areas. The, the military has an has a use case where after they've evaluated someone's hearing, they may have someone that would like, may need additional follow-up and they want the ability to connect them with a professional, someone who's an actual audiologist to perform additional testing. The other one is that in remote locations or to deal with populations that um, may not have someone that has hearing expertise locally. So we're working with a group in Alaska where there is a, you know, people are large distances apart and not every clinic has someone who has expertise in hearing. And so the idea is that by bringing them or supplying them equipment that allows them to perform that hearing testing and then providing the ability to remotely control and give, some, give the person basically a direct connection to them and interact directly with the equipment, you can conduct these, uh, conduct these diagnostic tests. And the last one that I'm going to end on from kind of an opportunities one is that the boothless technologies provide, provide this new ability to change where you conduct testing. And so in the military in particular, there's blasts and injuries that occur that cause people hearing loss. And one of the things that Boothless Technology has enabled, and I've got links on this site, I'm um, talking about uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jillian Curry Matthews, who's seated there with, a, with an individual, um, was that they're now able to test and um, interact directly uh, with them and, and look at new, with new courses of treatment that are time sensitive and important to get and act on early. And so this brings this capability further forward and makes this opportunity uh, available. And I think that there are maybe opportunities in um, industrial settings as well, where especially maybe loud sounds or people have um, uh, uh, exposures that have uh, caused sudden hearing loss could be, uh, could be followed up with. So I'm um, moving on to the end here. So in conclusion, I'd like to, uh, to point out that Occupational hearing conservation programs are really all about protecting individuals who are exposed to hazardous noise from developing noise-induced hearing loss and tinnitus. And with these new technologies that are often being marketed for boothless audiometry, they've got some new opportunities that allow us to rethink how we're applying the, uh, these, these tools. And in particular, this fit testing provides a new opportunity for we can think about how to change how we want to test, educate, and ultimately help individuals protect their hearing. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. I've seen a couple of good questions come up in the uh, chat. I've been doing my best to try to uh, keep track of those. So maybe we can uh, have a few of those from uh, Kay. Okay, great. Thank you, Jesse. It looks like we have about 15 minutes for questions. Just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat window on the right side of your screen and send to everyone. Uh, Jesse, the first question I saw is, um, is boothless audiometry approved by OSHA slash NIOSH? Yeah, so OSHA does not have anything that would specifically say that it approves boothless audiometry. So what happens is you have to make sure that you're operating within the requirements that they have set forth. And so the requirements that they have set forth are related to those maximum permissible ambient noise levels. Um, and so, so provided you're meeting those, and you're operating your system within that, it is acceptable to use boothless audiometry. Okay, great, thank you. The next... yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just gonna ask, I don't know if there's a way to have back and forth, but maybe, maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll answer. And then if we have more, feel free to, to chat into the, uh, the box there. Thank you. Sure, yeah, I'll keep an eye out um, in case there's follow-up um, to any of these questions. 
the next question I saw is, um, is the additional attenuation achieved by active noise cancellation? I think it's a question. Yeah, that's a great question. And so um, it is not, it is achieved through passive attenuation. And we made that decision um, in part because there has been a uh, certain regular, I, I, I don't remember exactly which one, but there's a certain um, regulation we came across that said active noise cancellation cannot be used for um, for noise for basically achieving that additional attenuation. There's often concern over the impact that may have um, uh, on on the test because, as you know, some of those systems don't always um, can introduce an alternative frequencies. But that's right now the system is designed purely to be passive, and the other reason is just for reliability sense. Um, very similar to a sound booth. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next question I saw is, um, do you have any recommendation for aided audiograms? I, I think what that's referring to, and, and, and I might need some help to understand if there was more on that one. Uh, an aided audiogram, I'm imagining that that has to do with, um, and I'm sorry, I probably should have gone into this in a little bit more detail. In Occupational hearing testing, it's been adopted for a long period of time to use automated testing of the traditional audiograms. And so the aided audiogram, I believe what's talked for here is kind of a, an in-between. So there's fully automated where someone responds and the algorithm adjusts what happens next, which level stimuli is presented. And then depending on how that person responds, it will either converge on something and give confidence that yes, I've identified this person's threshold. There's also purely manual, which is easy to understand, where the, the audiologist is directly controlling the stimuli. And this is probably for a lot of people that have had hearing tests um, where an audiologist is actively changing the level and turning it up and down. And then there's an in-between, which is, um, I believe what's referred to here is, is the aided audiogram. And therefore, what happens is it will provide a suggestion, and then the person can basically confirm, oh, yeah, I think I should test that level next. Um, and so those those things are provided by, I, I believe AMTAS does that, and we have a similar algorithm that kind of does that intermediate space where it will provide guidelines so that someone could still carry out a manual, a manual test, but a guided manual test or an aided test. Okay, thanks. Uh, I just got a comment related to that question. Um, Cheryl says, AD, uh, sorry, aided likely refers to hearing testing with hearing aids. This needs to be completed by an audiologist. Ah. Maybe that's, maybe Thank that's you. it. <laughs> yep. Okay. Sure. That that helps. And that yeah. Um, I don't have a recommendation for uh, a hearing aid performed audiogram. I believe that right now most of the practice has doing those tests in a sound field environment, primarily because the small volume around a hearing aid can create issues when trying to test pure tones. Got it. Thank you. Uh, the next question I have, um, someone's wondering, uh, with people wearing glasses, does this affect the earmuff cup fit? Hmm. It's, a, it's a great question. We typically encourage people to remove their, their glasses um, such that you don't uh, basically risk uh, it, uh, damaging the seal at the, uh, at the edge there. Okay, great. Um, Next person says, thanks for a great presentation. Um, they're wondering if you could go back to the graph on slide 19 to clarify how the headsets are providing enough attenuation since they are all well above the ANSI line. Sorry if they missed the explanation. <laughs> <Thanks. laughs> no, it's a, it's a great question. And actually the, the getting it out in the weeds of the regulations can be a little bit tricky. Um, so ANSI actually publishes different maximum permissible ambient noise levels. What they recommend for um, using a new, uh, let's call it an earphone or transducer, is that you need to start with the ears uncovered. So this is a situation where you imagine kind of the, the most stringent requirement. And then what ANSI allows you to do is it allows you to say, if I have attenuation, how much, what, what sound level could I still operate in? So basically you get to add this in and what's shown on these graph lines. So let me use my annotation again. Um, so for instance, on the Sennheiser HDA 300, right now we're looking at 500 Hertz and that has about 20, 20 D or sorry, about 10 DB of attenuation. So what they're saying is you take the ANSI level, which is normally 15 
you add that attenuation, which gets you to 25, and now you're okay to operate in an environment that has up to 25 dB at 500 hertz. As shown in the gray lines, though, you're nowhere near close enough uh, to operate in this two, these two particular environments that were significantly louder than that. So all of these lines that are for the particular transducers or the earphones, the Sennheiser, the our Adari Watts, and the deep insertions, those have the attenuation added to that ears uncovered, which then becomes the level that you're allowed to operate at. Hopefully that one uh, answered that question. It's a very good question. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, the next question I saw is, um, in the past I have used, I think, hopefully this is right, um, Howard Light or Howard Late mm. Verapro. I've heard this is no longer available. Can you confirm? I actually don't know for certain whether or not that's available or not, but I have had some familiarity with that system. Um, and we have, yeah, we, we looked at that one a little bit. I, I don't know whether or not that's still available. Okay, great. Uh, the next question I'll do my best with here. Um, Leah asks, does the audio metric test comply with CSA? And then um, I think the standard is CAN3Z107.4M86. Um, are you that one? I just uh, <laughs> looked it up. I think it has to do with um, <laughs> pure tone air conduction audiometers um, or audiometers for hearing conservation and for screening. I think is the standard or code. <laughs> uh, I will have to get back in touch with Lee if she can connect with me. Um, I am not 100% sure. I believe uh, we, we most likely do because a lot of these standards are are quite interrelated between like the ISO standard and the ANSI standard. We have currently been targeting the ANSI standard um, with compliance towards the ISO, and we actually are, have to be evaluated. We are registered with the FDA. Um, so I saw one of the other questions was, yes, we are registered with the, uh, as a medical device as an audiometer with the FDA. And by doing so, we have to be compliant with the ANSI requirement in particular. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, I think I saw your email address was um, at the bottom of one of the slides. Um, but uh, just so everyone knows, we do pass along um, a transcript with the questions to um, the sponsor. So they'll be able to also um, get to any um, that might need more information or if we um, don't get to everybody. Um, let's see, I think the next question I saw come in was, um, how comparable is the boothless testing per person versus using an ox uh, clinic or mobile van? Yeah, so that I'm going to refer you. There's a number of studies that are listed on slide 26, um, and I'm happy to follow up with ones that our group has done in particular. But there's also um, I know Shoebox has published a few as well. In general, there's been very good agreement provided that people are making sure to meet that background noise requirement in whatever context that means. So for OSHA, there's certain requirements for things that fall under MSHA. Um, and, but in general, the, there has been very good agreement. It's probably what's given a lot of motivation behind continuing to push towards this, uh, towards boost this audiometry. And, you know, again, broadly speaking, I think this is a really unique opportunity because it's been a while since the hearing industry in general has had much movement on how occupational testing is conducted. And I think there's going to be some really neat things with additional um, automation and making it easier to conduct a lot of these tests. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, I just saw a comment. Uh, your technology seems way ahead of what we have in the UK. Great to follow. So um, here at UK HCA, we can look to promote these new technologies. Thank you, Claire. Um, I, I saw, I guess, Leah um, actually sent in another question. I think it's the same, um, but um, I think we might have to get back. It's um, does the audio metric test comply with the current CSA standard? If so, does it come with documentation that it does? So maybe um, Jesse, if you could talk a little bit about um, just in general um, standards and documentation, if maybe that would help. Yeah. So the the the, uh, the the device currently comes with the description of the standards that it does meet, which are the ANSI and the ISO standards, and includes a calibration report as all audiometric equipment used in these things does that has to be performed yearly. So it's a full exhaustive calibration. Um, relative to the UK, uh, I, I'll just point out that actually, I, I probably should have mentioned on that, that slide with the, uh, the military, it was actually a combined effort between the UK Ministry of Defense and the, um, the uh, US Army um, in that particular instance where an individual was actually brought out of 
the field and was uh, was treated for hearing loss and he was able to actually recover his hearing. So that was great to hear that this from folks from the UK. Um, I, I will have to follow up on the CSA standard. I'm, I'm not entirely familiar with those. My, my, my expectation would be if we're not there, we're very close and we would provide documentation that does speak specific to that because that's what we do when we do our calibrations. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, the next question um, is, how does the user respond when they hear a tone? Is there a button that they press or do they swipe something on their mobile device? Um, and can um, the Adari be used with any mobile device? Yes, there's a couple couple good questions in there. The first is that they respond by pressing what looks like a large button on the uh, on the tablet or it can be used on a phone. And so basically it's like a large button that changes to indicate, uh, gives a very good visual indication of when they've depressed and shown that they've responded. Regarding different mobile devices and different operating systems, that was another early decision we made is that we wanted to be able to pair with Android or iOS or potentially Windows Mobile, and there, or actually even Windows 10. And the, the reason that we did that, again, the reason that we put all of the electronics that are so critical to the acoustics inside our headset was so that the only connection that's required is a lightweight Bluetooth command sequence to go back and forth. So um, the, the short answer is yes, it can be used on mobile devices and, and we have successfully, I've seen people interact with it through phones, um, through tablets, and there's actually even a way that we're working at now where one, in particular, this is actually very relevant to industrial testing, where one tablet can be used as kind of an administrator and can keep track of seven seven people at a time and make sure to see how they're progressing through the test and provide um, feedback or interaction without necessarily needing to get up, walk around and inter interfere. All right, thank you. The next question is, how does the annual calibration work? Do the headphones get mailed back to Adari? It's a great question. At present, yes, um, we, are, we are doing the calibrations uh, at Adari. Um, we have a plan because I know that a lot of um, audiometric equipment is you can be serviced by third parties. We have an understanding of what that would take, but it's currently not implemented right now. So for the foreseeable future, we're having people mail them back to us. Um, if downtime is an issue, we have had a few people that have gotten involved in a program where we basically send them out a piece of equipment that they can use. And so they have zero downtime uh, during that period of time. Okay, the next question I have is, um, if one has a total number of personnel at 100, how many of the devices should be acquired if they're needed for both audiometry and fit testing? That's a good question. I think it depends a little bit on the um, how, uh, how, how quickly they need to get through that group. My, my guess would be that'd be on order of well, I'm, I'm not sure, actually. Um, it would depend, again, on the resources available and, and how quickly you need to get through that group. It would probably be on order of one or two if I just had to answer off the cuff. Um, because, again, the, the actual occupational testing for people that need to be enrolled in hearing conservation, that typically takes uh, less than 20 minutes by the time someone begins to the time they're done. So you can use that as a scaling to kind of take decide how long that would take to get people through. And the other thing is the fit testing is a similar order of magnitude, actually even a, potentially a little bit faster to do the test where the additional time comes is in developing the educational materials and making sure that you have plans for what different hearing protectors you have available for them. Okay, great. Um, I think we have time for a short answer to one last question. Um, uh, wondering what techniques can be used to verify individuals exposed to noise are adequately protected. Yeah, so there's there's really um, there's the equipment that we've been talking about with like 3M and our headset and the other fit test equipment can be used to make measurements of the actual inserted hearing protectors. There is a opportunity to just do real basic tests, things like snapping or clapping to just make sure that someone has a, a some level of protection, but that's not very quantitative. And you also can't necessarily uh, determine if there's overprotection. So one thing we didn't have time to get in today, that I'll just briefly mention, is there's actually a situation where if you provide someone too much protection, it can put them in a situation where they cannot hear the what could be very critical communications for their environment. Um, this happens in things like uh, aircraft carriers, where there may be other things that are communicated 
through audio. And if you isolate them too much, you actually put them at a, at a different type of risk for an injury. That's not... Okay, great. Thank you, Jesse. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Um, just a reminder, we'll pass along any questions um, over to Jesse and his team um, in case any follow up is needed. Wanted to thank Jesse Norris for his presentation, um, Adari for sponsoring today's webinar and all of our participants. We have one more Synergist webinar coming up this week on Wednesday, November 17th. Please join us for heat stress and vector borne disease, mother nature versus flame resistant and arc rated clothing, a Synergist webinar sponsored by Bulwark. Thanks to everyone again and have a great day. Thanks Kay. All right, this was great. This actually concludes today's webcast. Thank you all for attending. The recording will be available at aiha.webvent.tv. We will send all registrants an email tomorrow with this link. And please visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts.